Um, well, good morning. It's nice to see you all this morning. Um, so I'm going to start today by reading um, a really well-known poem to you called Invictus. Um, if you haven't hold, heard the whole poem before, you'll probably have um, heard the last two lines. So I think it should be up on, well, it should come up on the screen. Um, so it says, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond the place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So it was, uh, this was written um, in 1875 by a man called William Ernest Henley. And it's often been used um, to sort of bolster the indomitable will and spirit of man over adversity, but it's also become somewhat of an atheistic rally. Henley was an atheist himself, um, and the last two lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, couldn't be a more pronounced denial of the existence of God, and the proud rejection that any other being has anything to do with me, and my castle. I am the center, I am in control, I bow to nobody and nothing. And it was actually written, well, 150 years ago, um, but I think it could have actually been written yesterday for the clarity with which it describes how many people think and live today. But the truth is, uh, we aren't the masters of our fate, and we aren't the captains of our souls. But there is one who is, and, um, and we see that quite clearly in the passage that we're going to be reading from today in Mark 2. Um, so Tim did a great job of introducing Mark last week, and in Mark 1, Jesus has been traveling around various towns. Um, he's been preaching and healing people, um, and he's just returned to his base in Capernaum, um, and he's been swamped by people wanting and needing things from him. So let's read today's passage. So it's Mark 2, Mark 2 1 to 12. It will come up on the screen, but if you want to get your Bibles out or your phones or whatever you want to read from. So that's Mark 2, 1 to 12. And it says, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, "'Son, your sins are forgiven.'" Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So I want to look at three things in this passage that I think Jesus communicates to us during this encounter. So firstly, he communicates who he is. Secondly, he communicates what our greatest need is. 
And lastly, I think he communicates that he has the authority to forgive sins and to deal with our need, our greatest need. But before we get into these, let's just take a a moment to think about what it would have been like to be there. And what sort of context is Jesus working in? So I wonder if you can picture this scene. (laughs) Jesus is in this house. He's trying to teach. It's heaving with people. It's heaving with people. There might be, it's probably quite a small house. Um, There might be anywhere from up to 50 people there. And suddenly there's this crumbling of clay and straw and debris from the roof. And it's falling on people in the house. It's falling on people. And I fully imagine there being shouting from the people below. Probably a load of people not really knowing what's going on. And then arrives this paralyzed man into the middle of the room. And, you know, we don't, we don't know what his reception would have been. But I can't imagine that everyone was sitting there quietly. You know, I imagine there would have been a fair amount of commotion and chaos. But Jesus, you know, he's not thrown by this at all. He's not caught in the commotion. He sees the man and he sees the faith of his friends that are on the roof. And he sees his hope in him. Hope that he's going to heal this man's body. Jesus knows exactly why they are there and what they want. Sometimes my, um, my youngest child, Aaliyah, she'll come up to me while I'm doing dinner and she'll say, oh, I'm hungry. And uh, now occasionally, you know, if it's still a while off, I'll give her a cracker or something. But usually I say, well, that's good because it's dinner soon. <laughs> and, uh, and she'll have a moan and uh, after a minute she'll get over it. I know what she wants from me, but I have the bigger picture that in 20 minutes, she's going to be eating a good meal. And my greater purpose is that her tummy is going to be ready for that meal. And Jesus is the same here, you know, he has a bigger picture. He has a bigger purpose. He isn't, he's not blind to why they've come. He knows they've come for healing, but Jesus doesn't say, son, you are healed first. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. He is there to draw out something bigger out of this encounter than just the healing. And one of the bigger things that he wants to communicate is who he is. When Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, he is making a direct claim to being God himself. And to understand why this is the case, we have to see that sin is primarily against God. Sin is primarily against God. Even when our sin is towards another person, it is also against God. And while we can forgive a person's sin against us, we cannot forgive all their sin. So I can forgive my husband Tim for eating my Advent chocolate. That is a true story. You can ask me about it, and I've got a whole list of what happened. Um, and uh, I did get revenge, though, so I'll, uh, you can ask me about it. <laughs> uh, but if he had eaten 10 people's chocolate, Advent chocolates, you know, I couldn't forgive those because the sin isn't against me. It's not against, yeah, he, he couldn't forgive that. I couldn't forgive those. Um, So when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, he is claiming that A, all the man's sin is against and B, that he has the right to forgive it all, both of which would make him God. And the scribes and the Pharisees that are sitting there, they're outraged. They understand very clearly what Jesus is is saying, and that's why they say, who can forgive God um, sins but God himself? This is blasphemy. And the fact that Jesus uses the term son of man um, to describe himself is also really inflammatory for them. Uh, We don't actually have time to really unpack that phrase, the son of man. Um, But if you want to uh, go and ask the Tims about it, I'm sure they'd love that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Of course, according to the law in the Old Testament, um, the Pharisees are right. Jesus' claim to forgive sins would be blasphemy. 
if he was just a man. But Jesus being God, it isn't blasphemy at all. But they don't for a minute think that what he's saying is credible or true. So Jesus throws out this tricky question for them. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? On the face of it, of course, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's no way of testing it, is there? I could say to you, oh, I flew 100 metres into the air today. But you can't prove that I didn't, even if it seems impossible, because there's no way of proving or falsifying it. So it's easy to, to say that. Whereas saying to a man who can't walk to get up is instantly testable, isn't it? Either he is healed or not. Jesus' words are proven true or not, then and there in that instant. So on one level, it seems harder to say, get up and walk. In reality, both are impossible acts, aren't they, for a mere human to do. And of course, the deeper reality is that forgiveness of human sin is far more difficult for God than healing someone's body. Forgiveness will cost the life of Jesus on the cross. It is infinitely harder. But in that moment, In that room, Jesus knows that the physical healing is the thread on which his claim of divinity hangs. The one will confirm the other. So he says to the man, get up and walk. And as he does so, Jesus shows he has the authority, not just to heal, but to forgive. And that he's the the authority because he is God. So what of that? What of that? If his divinity is one of the main things he wants to communicate here, what does that mean for me and you? It doesn't just affect the people in the room. It affects every human being that's ever lived. (laughs) If Jesus is God, then all he has ever said and done is true. And all things are created and sustained by him and under his authority and his rule. Dare we ask ourselves, do we live in this reality, in the revelation of who Jesus says that he is? Uh, Some of you um, will have come across the story of Corrie ten Boom. Um, She lived with her family in Holland during the Second World War. And um, as Christians, her and her family helped many Jews to Um, to escape and hide from the Nazis. And eventually they were betrayed and her family gets sent to prison and then to the concentration camp Ravensbrück. Um, And she witnesses the most horrific things there and endures a brutal regime. But she and her sister Betsy, they continue to follow Jesus there and they help many others to find him. And... um, and sometimes I think, you know, how, how do people do that? You know, how do they keep going somewhere so dark and awful where there seems no light and no hope? And um, in the book, The Watchmaker's Daughter, there is a section where Corrie and Betsy are in, in, the line of, in this line of prisoners that are waiting to be checked to make sure that they have nothing hidden under their clothes or anything. Um, and Corrie has actually stuffed this hidden Bible um, into some jumpers and put them under her prison clothes. And she prays, asking Jesus to send his angels to look after her. Um, and so they get to the first check, and the woman in front of her, um, they've just, she's just been searched, and she's found to have a jumper under her tunic, which is then taken away from her. And, uh, and Betsy says to Corrie, Corrie, her sister, she says, I can see the lump under your clothes really clearly. It's really obvious you've got something there. Um, but Corrie replies with confidence that the guards aren't going to see it. They're not going to see her at all. Um, so she gets to the checkpoint, and lo and behold, the guards completely ignore her. They don't even check her. It's like they don't see her. And then she gets sent on to the second checkpoint where they're actually patting prisoners down to be sure that no prisoners have any possessions. And again, Corrie just, she walks past them completely unchallenged. And, uh, and she walks out with her Bible. 
Um, and afterwards, Corrie says this. She says, Lord, if you answer prayer like this, then I can face even Ravensbrook. They knew deeply the reality that Jesus is God and that he has authority over their souls and their bodies. They knew that because of who Jesus is, they are not ultimately at the mercy of the darkness around them. They knew that there was nothing that could separate them from his love, from his power, or the truth of who he is. That was their reality. That was their reality. A firm resolve that Jesus is God and Lord on earth, even in Ravensbrook. And we desperately need that firm resolve, don't we, in our lives. We need that resolve and that reality. Um, we live in a world that doesn't want this reality to be true, a world that actively seeks to create a false reality where there is no God, where there's no ultimate authority, where there's no truth. Um, our world operates as though Jesus isn't there and his divinity isn't there. And truth be told, it's easy to be caught up in our world, isn't it, and lose sight of Jesus' rule and authority, to forget that he is the most solid reality that there is, that he has authority over our lives and our situations, over our pain and our joys and our hopes, and we are quick to forget who Jesus says he is. But what actually, and, and what that actually means for our lives, what does that change? And I'm saying this as much to myself as to anybody else because I found it hard to hold on to this truth at times in my life. This last year, I've, uh, I've really battled with doubt and, um, and I've felt it very subtly trying to undermine core parts of my faith, making me question the reality of, of truths that I live my life by. And, uh, and so I've had a real battle to, to hold on to the truths of Jesus' words and who he says he is, and especially so when I'm feeling really faithless. And, um, and actually what sometimes helped me to, is to think, but where else can I go? Where else can I go? If I don't turn to Jesus, where do I turn? I know my heart has all sorts of unpleasant things in. Unkindness, jealousy, bitterness, anger. I have problems inside me that I can't fix alone and while I might try to find other solutions to these issues there is nothing that can mend my heart like Jesus can when Jesus encounters the paralyzed man he sees into his heart he sees what needs mending but it's quite different from what the man thinks needs mending the man and his friends all think that what he most needs is to be able to walk. That what he most needs is to be able to walk again. And that if only he could have that need met, then that's going to fix everything. But Jesus is like, no, that's not what you need most. Your greatest need is to be forgiven. The deepest problem for the paralytic man is not his paralysis, it's his sin. Jesus doesn't heal him first, he forgives him first. Our deepest problem as, problem as humans is not the many things that we want fixing or healing or mending in our lives. Our biggest problem is that we are sinners and our sin gets in the way of being in relationship with him. Years ago, um, there was a film called Pay It Forward, uh, you might have seen it. It was, um, it was probably like 20 years ago. Um, it was about a young boy called Trevor, whose teacher at school had set him a challenge for the class. Set, he'd set this challenge for his class to come up with an idea that would change the world. So Trevor comes up with this idea that um, you do something good or kind, um, or you meet a need that someone has, and you do it for three people. And there have to be no strings attached, except that once it's been done for you, 
you must pay the goodness forward to three more people. So it quickly multiplies. The first person does it for three people, and each of them do it for three more people. And um, so Trevor decides that he's going to do it. So he, um, he gives some food to this homeless man, and he befriends him. Uh, I think he helps his teacher or something like that. I can't remember very well. Um, and the last act of kindness is that he helps a boy at school um, who he has seen being bullied by these two older kids. And, um, but as he confronts the boys that are roughing up this little kid, um, they actually turn on him instead and they stab him. And he ends up dying, and it's really sad. Um, but then um, his pay-it-forward idea, it takes off, and you see how the good of meeting people's needs is changing lives around the world. And it's a really moving story. It's a, it's a good film. But, um, but there are two big problems with this idea. Firstly, it assumes that by meeting people's felt needs, the world could be a changed place. When the reality is, and Jesus makes it clear, that while it's not a bad thing for people to have their needs met, it doesn't solve the sin and brokenness in our hearts. We can think that, um, that when I get that thing sorted on, in life or when I get that promotion, you know, if only I had that job, that house, that success, if only I were healed of this or that, then, then I will feel satisfied and happy and I won't have any problems. We can all think that, I think. Um, at Christmas, I was, you know, I was very, f fairly ill. Um, fairly ill. And uh, I had some really intense head pain. And I remember thinking, oh, that if this would just go away, I'll be so thankful for health. <laughs> I'll not take being well for granted ever again. <laughs> but lo and behold, within a week of being well, I got used to being healthy again. And once the need was met, I found that it didn't lead to unending thankfulness for my health. I just got used to it again. I got used to being healthy. And then the next felt need comes along. And uh, like the paralytic man, we can think that the fixing of our needs is what we really need. But Jesus says, no, <laughs> that's wrong. They're never going to satisfy you. They're never going to get rid of the real problem. Because the real problem is that you need me. You need me. You need my forgiveness. And that's the second problem with Trevor's plan to change the world, is that it depends on people. It depends on people. It depends on people's goodness to others. It depends on their morality. And while it's nice to think that it would work, the truth is it would falter. At the first person that struggles to be good kind or generous or people would be quick to judge wouldn't they who who should receive the kind act there would be a, a filtering of well who deserves it and who doesn't and you know the truth is our human nature just it just isn't as good as we think it is <laughs> our human nature isn't as good as people we will never manage to be saviors of the world <laughs> The best we can do is sometimes to meet people's felt needs, but we will never be able to affect the heart and soul change that is necessary because we don't have the authority or the power to do so. But Jesus says to us, I have the authority and the power. I know your hearts and souls inside out. I know your deepest need. And it's me. That's what he says. It's me. He has the authority to blot out all your sin, all your mess inside, all the things you've ever done that poison you and those around you, all your guilt, all your shame. He can say, your sins are forgiven, and they are instantly forgiven. Instantly. Because... Because he is Lord of heaven and earth. 
Does he care about our felt needs? You might be thinking, you might be sitting there thinking, well, does he even care about my other needs? Of course he does. Of course he does. Does he often meet our felt needs? Yeah, he often does, doesn't he? The Gospels are full of him healing people and meeting their needs. And whether that's leprosy or feeding the 5,000 or healing the paralytic man, he loves us. Of course it matters to him. Not only that, but that our bodily felt needs will be fully healed when we go to be with him. But the ailment of sin, it's going to destroy us. And he knows that only he alone can heal it. And it costs him everything to offer healing. It costs him everything. If you're not sure how much he loves you, or how valuable his offer of forgiveness is to you today. Just look at what he endured on the cross to heal your sin. That tells you all you need to know about the value of the forgiveness that he offers the paralytic man and us. The the paralytic man, you and I, we are not masters of our And we are not captains of our souls. Jesus is. (laughs) Lord, God, Saviour, Jesus, he holds the keys of our souls. And only he has the power to set them free from the pain of sin. So what are you going to do with that today? What are you going to do with that? Are you going to be the captain of your souls? Are you going to be searching everywhere for the deep healing that you need? Or are you going to come to him, to Jesus, to bow your knee, to acknowledge your need of him, and have your soul healed, (laughs) have your soul healed to its very depths? The song, um, there's a song called Come to the Altar, and it has the line, that Jesus is calling, and, uh, and he's calling you today. He's calling you today. He longs to lift the weight of your sin and replace it with forgiveness and freedom. He is good. He is our saviour, and he loves us deeply.